Hello and welcome to the session in which we would look at the filing status of the individual when they file their tax return. And here are the filing status, looking at the Form 1040, single, married filing jointly, married filing separately, head of a household, or qualifying surviving spouse, QSS. I call this qualifying widow or widower, and you will see why later on why I use the, this terminology. Now, I just want to show you here because since I am looking at the tax return, it says here, if you checked married filing separately, if you happen to be filing married filing separately, enter the name of your spouse. So the name of your spouse goes here because you're filing, sep you are filing separately from them. They're filing separately from you. Then it says here, if you check head of a household or qualifying surviving spouse. So if you check this box or if you check this box, enter the child name if the qualifying child is a child that's not your dependent. So what happens sometimes is to qualify under a head of a household or qualifying surviving spouse, you have to have what's called a qualifying child. Now, this qualifying child may or not be your dependent, most likely will be your dependent. But if they are not your dependent, put their name here. If they are your dependent, you put there's a, there's a section here where you put their name, their social security relationship to you, whether they qualify you for the uh, child tax credit or whether they qualify you for other dependent credit. We'll talk about that later. I just wanted to, sh to, to make point here because I'm looking at the form. So the five filing status are single, married filing jointly, qualify widow or widower, or what they call it the IRS qualifying surviving spouse, married filing separately, head of a household, before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. No obligation, no credit card required. Starting with single, who would file as single? Well, the status is available for people who are unmarried, divorced, legally divorced, or legally separated as of December 31st of that year, according to their state law. So let's assume George D was divorced in January and is unmarried at the end of the year. And also George does not claim any dependent, so they don't have any child or dependent. What is the filing status of George? Well, at the end of the year, he was divorced, unmarried. Well, what's available for them is single, single. Married filing jointly. This is the most advantageous. Here, both spouse must be married to each other at the end of the tax year, as of December 31st. Obviously, they have to be married. That's why it's called married filing jointly. Even if you got married on December 31st, so I'll tell you my story. I get married on December 27th. And I did, you know, back then my wife did not understand the tax law, but I insisted that let's get married between Christmas and New Year's Eve. But I really had a secondary motivation is to qualify for the whole year as a married filing jointly. Well, now my wife understands the concept and she's okay with it. And they both agree to file a joint return. Why? Because they must sign the same return. That's what married filing jointly is. And in this situation, both spouses would report their combined income and claim any credits and deduction on a single tax return. They will combine them together. Filing a joint tax return would result in a lower tax liability f than filing separately. Because if you're married, you have either married filing jointly or married filing separately. There's a small exception we'll talk about later. But married filing jointly is the most advantageous. Okay? So if one person during the year passes away, then for that year, you are considered married for the whole year. So let's assume in year X1, we have a couple and one of the, they're married filing jointly and one of them passed away. It's still married filing jointly for that year, assuming X1. Now, we're going to have another qualifying uh, status called qualifying widow or widower or qualifying surviving spouse. That's what the IRS likes to use. So remember, in the year of death, the married filing jointly will apply because they were married and one person passed away. So year one, year X1, year of death, they are married filing jointly. Now, in the following two years, which is year X2 and year X3, if the surviving spouse, now here you have to have specific rules. 
if the surviving spouse remain unmarried, they did not get married, and the end is important, have paid over half of the cost of maintaining a household, so the surviving spouse still maintaining a household and paid more than half, where a child who is his or her dependent lived for the entire, for the whole year, then you would qualify under qualify widow or widower or qualify surviving spouse. So to qualify under surviving spouse, you have to maintain a home, pay more than half of maintaining a home, and have a dependent child who lived with you for the entire year. So what happened if you don't have a dependent child and you are unmarried? Well, you go back to single. That's it, because you were married filing separately, uh, married filing jointly year one, year two, and year three. Well, you are remaining unmarried, but you don't need the child or the dependent, then you are back to single. Now, temporary, temporary absences are acceptable if the child was in college or in medical facilities. That's fine. And the child must be a child, your child, stepchild, including an adopted child, not a foster child. So it does not qualify you. So let's assume that last year the taxpayer spouse passed away and Paulette, the surviving spouse, did not remarry during the current year. So George was Paulette's husband. Okay, Paulette maintained a household for Tony and Maria who are her dependent children. Well, guess what? Under those circumstances, what's her filing status in the current year? The answer is qualifying surviving spouse. Last year, George and Paulette were married filing jointly. Assume that Paulette did not maintain a household for any dependent child and did not remarry. Well, under those circumstances, she will be single. Now, let's talk about the least advantageous filing status, and that is married filing separately. Now, couples will choose to, to file a separate return. That's, that's, that's up to them. That's, that's basically an option. Why? Maybe they want to keep their financing separate for whatever reason. It, just, it's, it's an option, and if, 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 the, if one of the couples would like to have it, that's up to them. Okay, they both have to make it filing separately. If one spouse itemizes, then the other will have to itemize as well. So let's assume we have husband and wife, and they, they choose to make it filing separately. We have the husband and we have the wife. And the husband, they have a lot of deductions, so they can itemize 40000 worth of deduction. The wife does not have a lot of deduction, maybe $500. If the husband itemized, then the wife will have to itemize. So wh why are we saying this? Because if you don't itemize, you can take what's called the standard deduction. And the standard deduction is approximately $13,000 even for a single, the lowest one. So if, if one itemizes, so basically the wife cannot take the 13000 or whatever that number is happens to be to change from year to year, she will have to itemize. Now, what is itemization? We'll see later on. It's it's happened on Schedule A. It's a list of items that you can bunch together and take as a deduction in, in total. So if one spouse itemizes, the other one will have to itemize, must itemize. Also, if you're married filing separately, you get penalized on many levels. For example, the individuals married filing separately, they cannot take interest deduction on student loan. Capital loss deduction is limited to, to 1500 Usually it's 3000 But since you're married filing separately, you get penalized. Also, you don't qualify for any earned income credit, child and dependent care expense credit. Let's talk about head of a household. Well, who qualifies? You have to be unmarried because remember, if you are married, if you are married, you have two options. You have married filing jointly or married filing separately. So head of a household... You, have, you are unmarried as of the last day of the year. There's a small exception, which I mentioned earlier, called abandoned spouse. I will talk about on the next slide. And so you have to be unmarried and maintain a home, household, which where you paid more than half of the cost of maintaining that household. Now, the household is basically your home, the taxpayer home, and you have at least one qualifying person. And that qualifying person is typically your dependent, such as child, qualifying child, or maybe other relative who lived with you for more than half of the year. So notice, head of a household, H, they have to live with you half of the year. Qualifying widow or widower, they, the, the child will have to live with you the whole year. You see, W, W, qualify widow or widower the whole year. That's why I use qualify widow or widower the whole year. Head of a household, H, they only have to live with you half of the year. They have to be either your qualifying child, we're going to look at a separate recording, or qualifying relative, we're going to look at a separate recording, what's qualifying child, what's qualifying relative. Now, for qualifying relative to 
to qualify you as a head of household, they, ca they, they must meet something called the relationship test. They have to be related to you. We'll talk about that later. But what's not related to you? Just kind of put it out there. Freeloading boyfriend or girlfriend will not qualify. Let's assume you decided that your girlfriend or boyfriend moves in with you. They live there. Um, you take care of the home. They're, they're living there. So you maintain a household and they're living with you for more than half of the year. Well, they don't qualify you because they don't meet the relationship test. Well, let's assume you're an irresponsible friend or friends. You have an extra room, they lost their job, and they're asking you if they can live with you. That's fine. They can live with you, but they are just friends. They don't qualify you as a head of a household for, the, for this qualification. Now, your parents... They will qualify you and they don't have to live with you. Remember, head of a household is the idea is you're maintaining a home and the person that you are taking care of is living with you for more than half of the year. Your parents can live in another home and as long as you are taking care of them, then they are considered your qualifying relative, then that's fine. They don't have to live with you. Just It's an exception. Now, head of a household filing status result in a lower tax rate and a higher standard deduction than a single. That's why you want to have this because it gives you a better tax status. Now, let's talk about abandoned spouse because when I talked about head of a household, I said you have to be considered unmarried or abandoned spouse. And what is an abandoned spouse? An abandoned spouse is someone who has been separated from their spouse either physically or financially without their consent. Let's just say physically to make it easy. So basically the person disappeared. Now to qualify as an abandoned spouse, a taxpayer must generally meet the following criteria. The taxpayer must have lived from their spouse for the last six months of the year. So the past six months, that's it. You're, you don't know where they are. You know They're not in touch with you. The taxpayer must have paid for more than half of the cost of maintaining a household for the taxpayer. So simply put, you are maintaining a household you are maintaining a house for yourself, you're paying more than 50% of the cost, and the taxpayer must have a dependent child that you can claim who lived with them for more than half of the year. Remember, this is, it's going to take you to head of a household. So, so what are we talking about here? Here we're talking about single parents, single mom or single uh father who are taking care of their ch child or children where the other person or their spouse just basically, you know, took over. This is what we're talking about here. So remember, since the other spouse is not there, they cannot mar they cannot file married filing jointly because you need to sign the return and the spouse is physically is not there. And and you can, your other option is married filing separately, but it's really disadvantageous for the taxpayer. So the Congress said, if you meet those criteria, those three criteria here, the, the, your spouse is away, you know, disappeared for the past six months, you are paying to maintain a household and you have a child in that household, then we would allow you to qualify as a head of a household because we don't want to penalize you and force you to merit filing separately because that's your alternative. So this is why we have an exception for the abandoned spouse. So in this recording, what I did, I went through the five filing status, single, merit filing, jointly, married filing separately, head of a household, qualify widow or widower, or qualifying surviving spouse. The only thing I did really did not get into, and I said I will, will, will look at a separate recording, is what is a qualifying child and what's a qualifying relative, because that's important when it comes to head of a household, when it comes to determine your dependency, your dependency inserting credit. I will do this in a separate recording. What should you do now? Go to Fort Hat Lectures and look at additional true-false MCQs, exercises that's going to help you understand this important topic, the filing status of the taxpayer. Think about it. If you're taking the CPA exam and you don't understand this concept, I really don't want you to pass the exam as an individual, right? And the AI CPA will not allow you to pass. So those are easy points that you can pick up on the exam or on your enrolled agent exam. And if you're taking a tax course, by all means, you want to know this and get an A. I'm always here for you. Invest in yourself. Invest in your career. Good luck and stay safe.